This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, we continue our examination into New York's infamous Son of Sam shootings. New evidence suggests that the Son of Sam killer, David Berkowitz, was part of a satanic cult that murdered six people. At an inn near Philadelphia, the head waitress sees a Revolutionary War soldier on the main staircase. In Jackson, Mississippi, a wealthy woman is kidnapped. Her millionaire husband gives in to the kidnapper's demands. Annie Heron is still missing. These intriguing stories all need one final clue, one final piece of information before they can be solved. Perhaps someone watching tonight can help. Perhaps it's you. people have seen and heard things around the General Wayne Inn in Philadelphia that they cannot explain. A number of different ghosts who seem to have an unusual agenda of mischief in mind. Located in Marion, Pennsylvania, the General Wayne Inn opened in 1704 and is reputed to be the oldest continuously functioning inn in America. Ben Franklin visited the inn, and George Washington slept in what is today this dining room. Edgar Allan Poe wrote part of his famous poem, The Raven, here in 1836. But it is a history of hauntings that brings us to the General Wayne Inn. Martin Johnson is the innkeeper and serves as vice president of the local historical society. We have had towels thrown all over the kitchen. We have had adding machine problems. We've had television problems directly attributable to something that was not understandable. We have had reports of sightings of entities, ghosts. We have had a funny incident with a new Cadillac in the parking lot outside. Last year, a valet walked by a Cadillac parked in front of the inn. The owner had gone inside and had taken his keys with him. Doors were locked, windows were all closed. The kid was scared to death. And I said, look, calm down. These things happen around here and just relax. And I enjoy these ghosts. I mean, they don't bother me at all. I think they come up with some real clever little things. For God's sake, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Like, on a busy anything. night, that's when this entity about? will start. Do what? And he'll go down the entire side of the bar, blowing on the back of the girls' necks. And the poor guys, they really were doing nothing. Now, I knew when the first one started that it would continue all the way down to the end of the bar. It always did. Did you do that? Do what? Blow on the back of my neck. It happened so often that I enjoyed standing back on the other side of the bar and watching. Hundreds of occurrences have happened. Some very minor, some more dramatic, but there have been hundreds of them. Bart has witnessed many ghostly events, but has never actually seen a ghost. Dave Rogers has. I was Mater D at the time, and I was, we were closing the restaurant up for the night. And I was starting on my way out, and I looked up. I only saw it for a split second. It was just a head sitting on this chest of drawers. It didn't register with me right away, 
And when I got out into the bar area, it was like, like I hit a, hit a brick wall and it just stopped dead in my tracks and I started saying, I, I saw a head, I, I saw something, I saw a head. It was just like it happened yesterday. I'll never forget the details, although I just saw it for an instant. Other employees have also seen apparitions. One day, Alice Gormley was walking through the dining room. And I heard someone call my name, Alice, Alice. So I walked out of here to see if it was the manager, and I saw this apparition, this person on the, on the stairs. And he was standing on th this step, and he looked so startled. And when I said, can I help you, he just disappeared. Local historian J. Robert Menti has studied the inn's history in detail, and according to him, this specter has been seen before, over a hundred years ago. The first written record of a ghost in the General Wayne Inn that we came across in writing was the report of an election in 1848 that took place in here. A lady went down to the basement to get some more ballots. When she came up, she said to the lady in charge of the elections, I just saw a soldier down there in a green uniform. In recent times, there have been three new sightings of this soldier. Manti interviewed three witnesses who saw the same apparition at different times. Each of them saw the ghost in this basement. It's an interesting place. I know there's a wine cellar here. And it was right by the door of the wine cellar that each one of them saw the apparition. This is it. This is where they found him. And he stood right there. Each one described the imperfect way, the green uniform and the yellowish lapel of the, and the black mustache of a Hessian soldier of the regiments that were occupying Philadelphia at that time. Hessians were German mercenaries who frequented the inn during the Revolutionary War. What about the um, British barracks room? Unsolved Mysteries invited Michaeline Mayer, a paranormal investigator, to the inn. Michaeline uses experimental research techniques that can separate fact from fiction. But without evidence, she refuses to believe that ghosts exist. Starting with detailed floor plans, she uses statistical analysis to evaluate the responses of both skeptics and hand-picked psychics who have been brought to the scene of the hauntings. When we bring them into a, an experimental situation, into a haunting, we ask them to tour the place where something has been reported. Michaeline has asked psychic Paula Rogers to walk through the building. Paula knew nothing about the inn's history. She went through every room, and in the basement, she made a surprising discovery. I got an extremely strong impression. I see a young soldier hiding. I can still see it. And he's in a very old costume. We're probably talking at least 200 years. I could see if it was a memory, him crouched there, petrifying. He seemed to have been left behind. Paula sensed the soldier only several feet from the spot where witnesses had reported seeing the Hessian. Coincidence or something more? You never know what they're going to do, and you never know how long they're going to do it. At the general wait in, the ghosts check in, but they don't check out. One night, Halloween during a local newscast Halloween story on the inn, a number of regular patrons gathered in the bar to watch. As soon as he showed the first scene of the inside of this building, the whole, no flop over now, no snow, perfect picture, the whole picture started to go very, very slowly, clockwise, all the way around. And all the 50 people in the bar were looking at this and wondering what was going on, and their all heads are all turning and the whole thing just kept going around until our portion was over. 
but it never did that before and it never did it afterwards and no one else in the whole neighborhood had it that way. Are there ghosts at the inn? Michael E. Mayer believes that something unexplained is going on, but as is so often the case, cannot prove for certain that it is caused by ghosts. We did get some interesting results. I can only call them tentative at this point, but our measures, experimental measures, our measures with random number generators, uh, and some of our uh, photography measures have given us enough of a hint that something is actually um, going on at the General Wayne Inn that deserves a great deal of further exploration. I know I saw something. I don't think it was a figment of my imagination. I don't think it was a, a mirage or, or whatever you want to call it. I, I saw something. I don't believe in ghosts, but I know they're here. They have no other place to go, and they might as well have a little fun, and that's exactly what they're doing. And I don't think they're going anywhere either. Our next story is about a modern-day Good Samaritan, a woman who dedicated her life to helping others, first as a mother and community volunteer and later as an advocate for children's rights and as a court-appointed attorney for criminal defendants who could not otherwise afford legal counsel. Two years ago, she fell victim to the same type of street criminal she once vigorously defended. After raising three children, Gretchen Burford embarked on a new life in 1979 when she enrolled in law school at the age of 41. By 1984, Gretchen had a full-time practice in Palo Alto, California. She specialized in criminal defense and juvenile law, motivated by a lifelong concern for the underprivileged, especially minorities and children. It appears it's a 489. You're looking at possible time in state prison. I think justice was really important to my mother. And I think that's part of the reason she was drawn to a career in law. She wanted to help people who didn't maybe start out with all the benefits that her children had. Gretchen put her heart and soul into defending the people. And she worked hard with them, not only just with the legal defense, but there were a lot of uh, things that she would be involved in as far as their personal lives. February 26, 1988 was a normal Friday for Gretchen Burford. Late that afternoon, she left her office and started home for the weekend. The police are unclear on her subsequent movements, but with the help of computer banking logs and eyewitness testimony, they have sketched out a probable scenario. They do believe that what happened next was a random act of violence by an assailant unknown to her. Bank records verify that at 6.37 p.m., Gretchen deposited a check for $449 at a branch bank four blocks from her office in Palo Alto. It was the beginning of a nightmare that would last for 30 terrifying minutes. It's here that we suspect that her assailant may have accosted her for the first time. She may have been the type of person who left her car unlocked, which is what assailants look for when they are stalking their victims. She's near a walk-up teller at night. Uh, obviously, she would be a target for some type of an attack. Gretchen was, um, was naive about, about how she handled herself uh, especially outdoors. She was never really aware of what was going on around her. The way she looked at things, I think she looked, looked at people very trustingly. Authorities speculate that Gretchen was abducted in the bank parking lot some five to 10 minutes after arriving there. The next 20 minutes are a complete mystery. What'd you do with the money to get the machine? I didn't take any money out. I, I made a deposit. How would you take me one of those those money machines, okay? You got that? We can park and we can walk around. What do you think, I'm stupid? No. What can you drive up to, though? Go! You can do some serious jail time for this. We can only speculate as to what I was going on anything. during that 20 minutes. She was used to this type of person, 
and perhaps was trying to uh, appeal to him uh, as to what the consequences would be. Uh, who knows? We don't know. At 7.02 p.m., 25 minutes after her first bank transaction, Gretchen attempted to withdraw money from another bank machine three miles away. This transaction was aborted when she requested more cash than she was authorized to withdraw. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Elise assumed Gretchen may have been trying to discourage her abductor. Where's the money? Where's I don't it? know. I don't money. know. I don't Do it know. again. Not working. Do it again. We had uh, two witnesses pull up behind Gretchen's vehicle. Uh, the male driver saw a struggle going on inside the car. He saw the driver's door open, and then it appeared that she was pulled back inside. Witnesses have told us that she got out of her car screaming, he stabbed me, he stabbed me, and uh, helped me. And she collapsed immediately. So the wound was, uh, was definitely a, a one single stab, and it was fatal. Police believe that Gretchen Burford deliberately caused the accident in a desperate attempt to escape. Her car came to rest 150 yards from the drive-up teller machine. In the aftermath, two witnesses were able to get a clear and detailed look at her killer. The lady jumped out of the car and screaming that she was stabbed. And then he got out of the car, stared me and my friend down. Then he turned around and ran. Within two seconds, three seconds, he was out of sight. Since the girl hit the ground, she said she was stabbed, we went for her. Step. She was lying on the ground, and I could see a little pool of blood. She was looking up at me. She was saying, I'm dying. I'm going to die. I said, you're just bleeding, and you're, you're going to be fine, so just you know, relax. And I, I held her hand. She looked up at me. Her eyes rolled back, and her eyes closed. And it kind of, I guess her life uh, ended right there. 133, can you ascertain a apartment number on my last call? 133. When I arrived at the scene, Gretchen had already been transported to uh, an emergency room. We, got here. we have a uh, female stabbing victim. Do we have we a perimeter down. set up with Yes, there? officers are around. There's okay. some evidence. Let's take a look at okay. it over here. I almost immediately started processing her vehicle for any evidence. Some blood. I wheel. looked inside and saw a paisley like a baseball hat, hat sort of in the rear passenger compartment that just seemed out of place. We later confirmed that that did not belong to her, and it's unknown how that got in her car. So we assume that it belonged to our suspect. The next day, authorities recovered the murder weapon, a butcher knife with an eight-inch blade. It was found in a driveway one block from the scene, but provided no additional leads. The investigation next focused on the unusual hat found in Gretchen's car. A check with the manufacturer revealed that only two stores in the area stocked this item. Even though all attempts to connect the Paisley hat with a suspect have failed, police are convinced it holds the key to solving the case. I think it's ironic that that my mother would have gone on helping, you know, for years probably, um, that she'd only just started her law career, that she had so much to give and was giving so much and, and helping so many people, and um, that it was, you know, it was just ended by somebody who had no idea who she was or what she was or no ability to care about her. Examine the Son of Sam shootings that took place in New York in 1976 and 1977. 
Investigative reporter Maury Terry believes that the son of Sam did not act alone, that he was part of an organized conspiracy that carried out a year-long reign of terror in New York City. The son of Sam shootings began on July 29, 1976. In eight separate incidents, six people were killed and seven seriously wounded. All of the shots were fired by a 44 caliber revolver. Police created composites from eyewitness accounts of the shootings. The difference in appearance suggested more than one suspect. But on August 10th, David Berkowitz was arrested and confessed to all of the Son of Sam shootings. Investigative reporter Maury Terry gathered evidence that indicated that more than one man was involved. The general perception among the public for years had been that David Berkowitz was a lone gunman. The facts and the evidence, not speculation, the facts and the evidence say otherwise. Terry found major discrepancies in eyewitness accounts of the last shooting that support his theory of more than one gunman. Eyewitness Tommy Zeno was parked just in front of the victim's car, and he got a good look at the gun. No, I didn't think it was David Berkowitz then, and I don't think it's him now. I definitely don't think it's him. A yellow Volkswagen had been spotted leaving the crime scene. It may have contained one or more accomplices to the shooting. Columnist Jimmy Breslin received a letter from the son of Sam. In this letter, there were cryptic references to the, quote, 22 disciples of hell and a wicked king wicker. John Wheaties, the rapist and suffocator of young girls, was also mentioned. The letter was signed the son of Sam. Underneath was a satanic symbol. Maury Terry believes that the Breslin letter was sent not by Berkowitz, but rather by a satanic cult that operated in Berkowitz's Yonkers neighborhood. He also believes that Berkowitz was a member of the cult and that it was this group that planned and executed the Son of Sam attacks. David Berkowitz lived in a seventh floor apartment in Yonkers. Down the hill was a street named Wicker. Could this be the King Wicker mentioned in the Breslin letter? Wicker Street was near the home of another character believed to be mentioned in the letter, John Wheaties. I learned that the John Wheaties rapist and suffocator, alias of the killer in the Breslin letter, was not really an alias at all, but it was the name of a real person. That person was John Carr, who was the real life son of Sam Carr. John Carr's nickname was Wheaties, and I learned this within a day of the arrest. And from then on, uh, I became deeper and deeper involved in the case, uh, trying to locate John Carr. This is the face of John Carr. And these are the composite drawings of the 44 caliber killers. Maury Terry believes that there is a resemblance between these two and John Carr. Terry tracked John Carr to Minot, North Dakota, where he had worked as a mechanic at a local Air Force base. Though he lived in Minot during the mid-70s, Carr frequently commuted to New York during the time of the Son of Sam attacks. Well, from my experience, John Carr was a mixed up drug addict. He was hanging around with the group of people that were uh, on the other side of the law all the time. John Carr, many, many months before Berkowitz was ever arrested, had talked about his friend Berkey to his friends out in Minot, North Dakota. John Carr was a friend of, a confidant of, and an associate of David Berkowitz. On February 17, 1978, six months after Berkowitz's arrest, John Carr was found dead in his girlfriend's Minot apartment. When I first walked in the room, it was a ghastly sight. Obviously, the guy had sat on the edge of the bed, put the gun in his mouth, and pulled the trigger. My first interview with his live-in girlfriend at the time, she told me that he must have just taken his own life. The next day, same person, new interview, whole new story. John Carr had to have been murdered. He was wanted by the police in New York for the Son of Sam killings. He was afraid for his life, and I fully believe that John Carr was murdered. Through interviews with uh, Carr's friends and the police officials in North Dakota, uh, the picture emerged of John Carr being heavily involved in satanic cult activity, both in Minot, North Dakota, and in Westchester County, New York, where he spent part of his time. 
Uh, it involved blood drinking, urine drinking, the ritualistic sacrifice of animals, specifically German shepherds, uh, all sorts of, of very, rather horrible activity that certain satanic cults get into. The satanic symbol found on the Breslin letter, directly under the signature of Son of Sam, was also found inscribed on Carr's Minot phone book. One of Carr's Minot acquaintances was a man named Phil Falcon. Falcon accidentally walked in on John Carr and a companion performing a satanic ritual. Phil Falcon told us that he walked into his own house one night in North Dakota and found John Carr and another friend of Carr as part of the circle in the act of ritualistically sacrificing an animal right in Falcon's uh, house. And Phil Falcon also told us that John Carr belonged to a very, very violent satanic cult. Prison sources who knew Berkowitz told Maury Terry that Berkowitz had been introduced to this cult by John Carr's brother, Michael, in 1975. Michael Carr ended up inviting Berkowitz to attend what he called a floating coven party. And uh, Berkowitz came in and attended the party and symbolically, not literally, but symbolically, the 44 was put into his hand that night. That's how he got in to the, into the cult scene. At 4 a.m. on October 4th, 1979, over two years after Berkowitz's arrest, Michael Carr was killed. He was driving at a high rate of speed when he crashed into a light post on New York's West Side Highway. He died just 18 months after his brother. How many members of this devilish cult? Conclusive proof that Berkowitz knew both John and Michael Carr came during two of his depositions on October 25th, 1978. When asked point blank whether he knew John Carr, he answered, yes. Yes. In another deposition taken on January 19, 1982, Berkowitz was asked if the cars were part of a satanic cult. He also answered, yes. When asked whether the brothers were killed to ensure their silence, Berkowitz again responded, yes. Maury Terry believes that the death of the cars may have been engineered by the, quote, 22 disciples of hell mentioned in the Breslin letter he also believes this is a satanic group that held the rituals in Untermeyer Park, located just one mile from Berkowitz's apartment. It's right up ahead, right there. On August 11th, 1977, the day after Berkowitz's arrest, two young boys led police to a grave that contained the bodies of three German shepherds. Two of them had been strangled with chains. One had been shot in the head. At least 10 other slaughtered dogs had been found in the park area. We received information that groups of people who attired themselves in black or dark colored robes with hoods were chanting, carrying on some types of rituals on the aqueduct in the rear of Untermeyer Park. Subsequently, the authorities did find some remains of dogs and uh, the information that we had was that this group of uh, people were sacrificing animals in a satanic ritual. I got a call from a young boy in Yonkers, 15-year-old high school sophomore, wanted to know if I knew that there was a satanic cult that was meeting uh, in Untermeyer Park in Yonkers and killing dogs. And so I met him down there, which is just about a mile from Berkowitz's uh, residence, and he took me around to various spots in Undermeyer Park, showed me where the cult was meeting. We saw all the satanic graffiti, very sophisticated graffiti at the time, and uh, took me throughout the park. Over here on the other side of the wall, uh, I had found three dead dogs. Saw the remains of probably uh, two or three German, dead German shepherds right there at that time. And he took me along the aqueduct, literally the gutters of NYC from the Breslin letter, and showed me where they had set up an altar. They had an altar. They had, they placed the altar uh, board right over here in between the two trees. Uh -huh. And they had well, now we chair, had the cult and we knew where it was meeting and we could tie it right to the Son of Sam case and the Son of Sam letter. It was a very significant development in the case. You'd like to see 
uh, your case is resolved with a conviction or an acquittal or no case or whatever. But it's when you have these constant doubts, who else was involved? Uh, were there others involved and to what extent? Will they do it again? You see, that becomes the, uh, the overriding concern. If there is someone out there who was involved in the Berkowitz cases, in the killing of a number of people and the wounding of a number of people, and that person is bent on doing the same thing again, then the public's in jeopardy. And so certainly I would like to have that solved and get that person out of the way. Cult activity has continued around Undermeyer Park since the Son of Sam killings. While we were filming, two local residents told us they had witnessed a satanic ceremony in 1987. About a year and a half ago, me and my cousin were watching TV and we saw a car headlights go by on the aqueduct path. When my cousin took a flashlight and I took on a baseball bat and walked up through my yard onto the aqueduct path, there must have been about 15 to 30 people. And there was one guy, and he must have been like the head chanter or something, because he was chanting the loudest over the other people. We just froze. We didn't know what to do, because we'd never encountered something like this before. We both decided just to get out of there. We didn't want to get seen, because you don't know what people like that will do. But I think it would serve the public interest for us to know if, in fact, a cult does exist, if in fact they engage in satanic activities, if in fact sacrifice is part of that activity, if in fact human life is the sacrificial aspect of that activity, and how it's impacting upon uh, life in our respective communities. The Queens District Attorney would like to question the individuals that match these composites. They would also like to locate the yellow 1971 Volkswagen noticed at the scene of one of the Son of Sam attacks. Its license ends with the letters G-U-R or G-V-R. If Maury Terry is correct, the satanic group responsible for the Son of Sam attacks is still alive, still meeting, and still recruiting new members. If this last claim is true, certainly that is the most disturbing thought of all. Next, the story of a Mississippi millionaire desperately searching for his kidnapped wife. The ransom money has been paid, and Annie Laurie Heron is still missing. In this house in Jackson, Mississippi, lives 71-year-old Robert Heron, one of the wealthiest men in the state. His wife, Annie Laurie Heron, is 72, a devoted wife and mother. She's well-beloved and extremely active in the social and civic life of Jackson. On July the 26th, Annie Laurie Heron was kidnapped. Good morning. Twelve days later, Robert Heron called a press conference at his home. The kidnapping was linked to one of Heron's businesses, and he wanted to make a personal plea to the kidnapper. My name is Robert Heron. My wife, Annie Laurie, was taken from our home over 10 days ago. My children and I have done everything humanly possible to obtain her release. Like any businessman, I've made decisions which may appear to others as unfeeling, but those appearances are just not true. Moreover, those business decisions were mine, not my wife. She had absolutely nothing to do with them. My children and I appeal to whomever has my wife that they may say that she may be safely returned to us. Thank you. I think about Mama all the time, and uh, I'm sure my Daddy does too. There's, there's no real way to quantify what this, uh, how enormous a, a tragedy and ordeal this has been to him and, and to the rest of the family. Annie Laurie Heron's kidnapping was unusual. Rather than simply insisting on money for himself, the kidnapper left a note naming 12 people whom he felt were owed money by one of Robert Heron's companies and should be paid back. It is Robert Heron's desperate hope that someone watching tonight will come forward with information that will lead him to the woman he loves, the woman he married 48 years ago. When Robert Heron came home from work on the afternoon of July the 26th, he was alarmed to find that his wife was not in the house 
After checking with friends and family, he called the police no, to report her missing. I'll wait right here for you, officer. Thank you. Then Mr. Heron made an alarming discovery. A note, apparently left by a kidnapper, lay by his front door. The note said, do not call the police. However, Mr. Herring had notified the police prior to the note being discovered. Responding to Mr. Herring's missing persons report, police arrived at the scene and found that it was now a kidnapping connected in some way to Robert Herring's business dealings. John, you need to take a look at this. Robert Herring put these people back in the shape they was in before they got mixed up with school pictures. The they demands in the note were very vague. They made several this, demands so of Mr. Heron concerning certain individuals uh, listed on the note before. who were allegedly harmed by a company of which Mr. Heron was president. Heron had been president of School Pictures, a company that sells franchises to photographers throughout the United States to produce portraits of school children. Between 1981 and 1983, in an effort to collect outstanding debts, school pictures filed lawsuits against 12 franchise owners in eight states, including Florida. On the day of Annie Laurie Heron's kidnapping, neighbors had reported seeing vehicles that seemed out of place in the neighborhood. We had uh, calls from uh, various people that there had been two particular vehicles that had been seen in that neighborhood, one of which was a pickup truck, and the other was a white cargo van. The cargo van had a Florida plate on it. Police discovered that the 12 people on the kidnappers' list were the same 12 sued by school pictures. They resided in eight different states, but they were all sued through the Hines County Court in Jackson, Mississippi. Their names are easily available to the general public in county court records. This means that the kidnapper need not have been one of the 12 people on the note. It's possible that these 12 people had absolutely nothing to do with this abduction. But however, you can't rule out the fact that maybe somebody, especially that had the knowledge of school pictures and its uh, operation, could have been involved with it. No specific ransom demand was contained in the letter. We assumed it was a ransom note, uh, and we wanted to comply. We wanted to do everything we could to get Mother back. School Pictures was requested to look into their files on these uh, 12 people. The transactions were reviewed, and uh, letters were, of course, sent out to these uh, 12 people. Uh, trying to determine what damages uh, that, that they had. What did they want? Um, at that point, uh, we didn't get a uh, response except from several of them saying, we don't want anything. Eight days after his press conference, Robert Heron received a letter. He recognized the handwriting. It belonged to his wife, Annie Laurie. We had hit a very low ebb prior to August 15th. And that was the day that we received a letter in mother's handwriting. And it basically uh, pled with daddy again to comply with the demands um, and to please save her. This gave us quite an emotional lift because it meant that mother apparently had survived the, the initial struggle. But it still was extremely vague as to what we were to do. At that point, daddy, in order to do something to show our good faith effort to comply with these vague demands, instructed um, his attorneys to check these roles and find out how much school pictures had sued these 12 individuals for. Robert Heron Sr. sent out checks totaling nearly $1 million to the people on the list. Half of the checks have been returned. More than four months have passed since Annie Laurie Heron was abducted from her home neither her family nor the authorities has had word from her or the kidnapper since the letter they received on August the 15th. It's been our sincere desire from the very beginning, from the, the moment of the kidnapping, that we do everything possible to comply with these demands. We want mother back. Um, it's not our intention to 
question the motive of these people at this point. Uh, whatever they want, we want to give it to them so we can get mother back. That is our very paramount concern. Update. Last month, Newton Alfred Wynn, a 65-year-old lawyer, was arrested by the FBI in Florida on charges relating to the abduction of Annie Laurie Heron. Wynn was one of the 12 men named in the ransom note left at the Heron home. Also less than one month before the kidnapping, he had allegedly purchased a van which matched the description of the vehicle seen in the Heron neighborhood. A woman told the FBI that Wynn had promised her $500 to travel from Florida to Atlanta, Georgia and mail a letter for him, just 16 days after Annie Laurie Heron was kidnapped. He handed her a manila envelope. Inside was the letter wrapped in a gray linen napkin. Wynn instructed her not to look at or touch the letter, but to deposit the letter in a mail slot, she had to ease the napkin off, and she was able to observe the writing on the envelope. Later, she identified a photograph of the envelope Robert Heron had received from his wife as the one she had mailed in Atlanta. I think about mom all the time, and uh, I'm sure my daddy does too. There's, there's no real way to quantify what this, uh, how enormous a, a tragedy and ordeal this has been to him and, and to the rest of the family. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Thank you.